Hi, my name is Troy Parfit, and I'd like to welcome you to Beyond Order, Jordan Peterson, Crypto Fascism, and the Occult, part one of a series in which I will explain, mostly through an analysis of Jordan Peterson's newest book, how the world's most recognized clinical psychologist is a crypto fascist and an occultist. On March 2nd, 2021, Penguin Books released Jordan Peterson's third book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life the follow-up to his best-selling 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Naturally, Beyond Order quickly garnered reviews, including one from Canada's Globe and Mail, along with The Guardian and The Atlantic Monthly. Across these reviews, praise is outweighed by criticism and even mockery. The Globe and Mail review is easily the most funny and flippant, but also the least revealing. Journalist Kath L. Kelly doesn't have much time for Peterson's mythology talk or his life lessons from Tiamat, Goddess of Chaos and he notes how Peterson's followers react to perceived slights against their leader by lining up and declaring, I'm Peterson. No, I'm Peterson. How true. But we don't get much insight or substance about Peterson or his book, and in any event, the review is now hidden behind a paywall. Guardian reviewer Andrew Anthony is a little more penetrating and thoughtful. He concludes, There is too much messianic passion and not enough enlightening psychology in Peterson's follow-up to 12 Rules for Life. Messianic? Yes but almost certainly unrelated to the type of messiah that Mr. Anthony has in mind. He does better when talking about the views that made Peterson famous. Depending on where you stood, Anthony writes, Peterson either swept away a lot of woolly thinking or produced a guidebook for the kind of embittered men who formed Donald Trump's Praetorian Guard of Proud Boys. Correct, or at least the Proud Boys assessment is correct. In describing Beyond Order, Anthony says, It's as if Peterson's addressing a convention of Dungeons & Dragons fans, an impression that's only deepened by his close and repeated analysis of the archetypes in the Harry Potter books. The Dungeons & Dragons evaluation is also spot on. In fact, I've heard male teenagers say that they were playing too much D&D before heeding Peterson's advice and taking more responsibility in life. They put down their action figures and began their hero's journey, off to slay the dragon and get its gold. Anyhow, even though Mr. Anthony's references to the Proud Boys and Dungeons and Dragons are fitting, the Guardian review comes up short. The same can be said for Helen Lewis and her review in the Atlantic Monthly called What Happened to Jordan Peterson. Therein, Lewis mentions her acrimonious British GQ interview with Peterson. Peterson was angry and hostile throughout, whereas she was calm and professional, and all the subsequent hate messages she received from his acolytes. How dare this female question or criticize the uber-masculine lobster god? Kathy Newman at Channel 4 News came in for similar treatment after she, too, had the temerity to act like a journalist. An extra security had to come to the studio in case any of Peterson's louts followed through on their threats. Peterson said, in a typical display of narcissistic rage, If I wanted to sick my internet trolls on Channel 4, there would be nothing but broken windows and riots, right? And this is how it goes. Peterson threatens his critics, and does internet trolls do his bidding? If anyone criticizes such troglodyte behavior, the cycle repeats itself. But getting back to Lewis, she's rare in that she's a journalist who seems to suspect that something about Jordan Peterson is seriously wrong. I think that she thinks that he's a fascist. Here's a passage from her review. After the Indian essayist Pankaj Mishra charged Peterson with peddling fascist mysticism, Peterson tweeted that Mishra was an arrogant, racist son of a bitch and a sanctimonious prick. He added, if you were in my room at the moment, I'd slap you happily. Even sleep brought no relief. Peterson is a believer in dream analysis, and after one particularly ill-tempered interview, he blogged about a nightmare that followed. In his dream, he met a man who simply would not shut up. The man reminded him, he wrote, of an acquaintance at a university in Canada he calls Sam who drove around in a Mercedes with swastikas on the doors, saying the worst things he could, unable to resist inviting attacks. I can't help myself, Sam had told Peterson. I have a target drawn on my back. Eventually, at a party, Sam overstepped the line. He was about to be assaulted by a mob until another acquaintance felled him with a single punch. Peterson never saw Sam again. In his dream, the Sam-like man talked and talked and finally pushed me beyond my limit of tolerance. I bent his wrists to force his knuckles into his mouth. His arms bent like rubber, and even though I managed the task, 
He did not stop babbling. I woke up. It is hard to resist reading the subtext like this, Helen Lewis continues. Peterson had spent months being casually described as a Nazi and associated with the alt-right, labels he always rejected. He had metaphorical swastikas on his car door. He couldn't resist putting a target on his own back, and he too couldn't stop talking. Indeed, in May 2019, after railing against left-wing censoriousness, now widely called cancel culture, he met with Viktor Orban, the proudly illiberal prime minister of Hungary, whose government has closed gender studies programs, waged a campaign to evict Central European University from the country, and harassed independent journalists. Orban's state-backed version of cancel culture, or to use the correct word, authoritarianism, apparently didn't come up in their meeting. Peterson had previously told an interviewer to describe politicians like Orban not as strongmen, but as dictator wannabes. Nonetheless, the visit, and the post photograph of the men in conversation, released to friendly media outlets, gave intellectual cover to Orban's repressive government. Again, when it comes to Jordan Peterson, Helen Lewis has been, more or less, on the case. She's obviously suspicious of Peterson's intentions, and is one of just a handful of journalists to challenge him directly. However, although she has come close to figuring out who Jordan Peterson really is, and what he's hoping to achieve, she too has missed the mark. Not only has Jordan Peterson met with Viktor Orban, he has come to the rescue of Alex Jones, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump, and Tommy Robinson, a football hooligan turned neo-fascist who's like a character straight out of train spotting. Peterson networks with white supremacists like Faith Goldie, who was outed as a neo-Nazi, Lauren Southern, who was barred from the UK under a terrorist act, and Stéphane Molneux, to whom Peterson identified as alt-right. Therefore, Lewis's claim that Peterson has always rejected being alt-right is inaccurate. Peterson does interviews with other racists and far-right cranks, like Douglas Murray, Dave Rubin, Jonathan Pajot, Godsad, and Rex Murphy, and has agreed with the views of white nationalist Ricardo Duchesne, author of Canada in Decay, Mass Immigration, Diversity, and the Ethnocide of Euro-Canadians. Duchesne was a professor at Canada's University of New Brunswick, until he was outed as a white nationalist and academic fraud by his peers. Canadian media outlets published disturbing quotes from Duchesne that looked nearly identical to quotes from Mein Kampf. Jordan Peterson has also courted and appeared with Charlie Kirk, who helped foment the 2021 storming of the U.S. Capitol, and Peterson has characterized that attack as events, criticizing the government for imposing a curfew after such events. When Jordan Peterson defended Tommy Robinson who has done time for assault, using false travel documents, breaching the peace, and mortgage fraud, Peterson implied that the UK government had mistreated Robinson and jeopardized his life by putting him in jail. Lately, Peterson has been trying to whip up resentment for Canadian politicians by implying, falsely, that COVID-19 measures have been draconian. He did something similar when he lied about Canada having compelled speech laws, which he claimed, and this is rich, were the product of a communist plot. Canada does not have compelled speech laws, nor was any such legislation ever tabled, as Peterson's own lawyer admitted before members of the Canadian Senate, and as the Canadian Bar Association and various legal scholars made clear to the public. In Canada, compelled speech would be an impossibility. Canada is one of the most democratic countries that's ever existed, tied with Denmark at number seven in terms of democratic freedoms, according to The Economist, a conservative publication. And need it be said, Canada is in no way communistic. I mean, good luck finding a Canuck who has decorated their home with Soviet propaganda. Well, besides Jordan Peterson, who appeals to adherents who would never think of such contradictions, who would believe that the Canadian government really was communist, and who would send hate mail and threats to female journalists for questioning their master. Jordan Peterson has recurrently identified as the saviour. He has urged his followers to sacrifice goats in backyard rituals that ought to be sufficiently bloody so the goat slaughterers might transform into a new man, and he teaches that the alt-right project is incomplete. He is also fond of demonstrating the goose step and Zig Heil to his students at the University of Toronto. Why would he do that? Does he think his learners don't know what the goose step or Zig Heil look like? But then, why would he boast about Hitler's supposed ability to give the Zig Heil for eight hours straight? And why would Peterson give the Zig Heil to his students for a full 15 seconds? 
in-class calisthenics mandated by the Stalinist regime in Ottawa, perchance, that even the better and more critical journalists have missed or omitted Jordan Peterson's gushing about Hitler, his raving about the orderliness of Nuremberg rallies, and his self-descriptions which match witness accounts of Dr. Joseph Mengele, the SS officer who gladly sent around 400,000 people to the gas chambers and crematoria at Auschwitz, and who took particular delight in personally experimenting on and murdering children, is profoundly distressing. It's not as though such statements are difficult to find. They're hiding in plain sight. In 12 Rules for Life, Peterson quotes the dogmatic Tao De Jing to say, to master oneself requires the Tao. He often tells his followers that they need to integrate the Jungian archetype of the self, failing to explain that it's comprised of two halves, Christ and the Antichrist. And in 12 Rules, he writes, the self is the great actor of evil who strode about the stage of being as a Nazi and Stalinist alike, who produced Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau, and the multiplicity of the Soviet gulags. To reformulate, Peterson's adherents need to master and integrate the archetype of the self, one half of which is satanic, and the self is responsible for constructing Nazi death camps. Peterson's followers must internalize this demonic and homicidal quality, make it part of who they are. That way they can become complete, fully integrated human beings who can move forward and bring order to chaos. He also says in 12 Rules that he understands his own capacity to act like a Nazi prison guard or Gulag Archipelago trustee or torturer of children in a dungeon. Should this require an explanation, that's Dr. Jordan Peterson admitting that he could torture children in a dungeon possibly at a Nazi concentration camp, like Dr. Joseph Mengele tortured children in his blood-stained underground lab at a Nazi concentration camp. Mengele electrocuted children, amputated their limbs without using anesthetic, and injected dye into their eyes and chloroform into their hearts, which caused heart failure. I am confident that Jordan Peterson is aware of this because in 12 Rules he writes, Over the previous decades, I had read more than my share of dark books about the 20th century focusing particularly on Nazi Germany. You will no doubt chalk up what I'm going to say next to coincidence, but keeping in mind that Peterson has spoken about Mengele and has said that he watched a movie about Mengele called The Boys from Brazil, he mentions twice in 12 Rules chloroform in connection with anesthetic and says that in the past, young, healthy, courageous men simply did not need anesthetic. Like I said, feel free to dismiss this as coincidence. The connections are tenuous at best. But I ask you, why would he talk about chloroform in relation to anesthetic and young men not requiring anesthetic, presumably during surgery, in a book that he has said is predicated on the topic of the Holocaust? On March 8, 2021, Jordan Peterson said to Brett Weinstein that all three of his books, including Beyond Order, were based on the motivations behind the Holocaust. Two of his books are self-help books. How could self-help books be mostly about the Holocaust? And if Beyond Order is about the Holocaust, why does the word Holocaust not appear in the book? Why does it only appear eight times in his three books? Moving on, when Peterson says, in the same sentence, that he could work as a Nazi concentration camp guard and torture children in a dungeon, he's not being honest about his dark side. He's signaling that he's a psychopath. Twelve Rules for Life has supposedly sold more than four million copies. Did none of the readers think, hold on, why should I take life advice from a man who says he's capable of torturing children in a dungeon? The answer is probably, no, they didn't think that, because Jordan Peterson never told them to. Here's another line from 12 Rules for Life. What do we see when we are swept up in the fire and drama of a National Socialist rally? This bit of persuasion, for all speech is meant to persuade, includes a begging the question fallacy. It presupposes that when you watch a video of a Nuremberg rally, he would be swept up in the fire and drama. Put another way, Peterson's ideal reader is someone who could be swept up in the fire and drama of a National Socialist rally, and think that a small L liberal government is trying to mandate their speech, as though they were living in North Korea. We can speculate that Peterson gets swept up in the fire and drama of Nazi rallies, because whenever he talks about men in jackboots marching around at Nuremberg prior to their campaign of mass murder, he becomes manic. Here's Peterson describing such a rally. Huge crowds at Nuremberg, where all the Nazis would gather in perfect squares, right? 
absolutely perfect. Thousands of people lined up in absolute precision. And then, when they goose-stepped and marched, it was, everyone was exactly the same. So, orderliness gone mad. You know, an orderliness is actually one of the sine qua non of an industrialized society. And that's one of the things that makes that so terrifying, because it also means that part of what drove the Germans to their high levels of engineering excellence, for which they were absolutely renowned, not only in World War II, but certainly even now, was that orderliness, that, that unbelievable orderliness. And here's him describing a Nuremberg rally again. Hitler built the biggest parade grounds in human history to host the Nuremberg rallies, and he would get in front of them on this huge stage with Greek columns, very impressive looking, and have blocks of thousands of people organized perfectly, orderly. The Germans are good at order. Fascinating. The Germans are good at order, and Nuremberg rallies had so much order that they went beyond order in what Peterson describes as orderliness gone mad. He has also said that the kind of order at Nuremberg shades into tyranny, by which he meant genocide. The Nazis just went broader and broader, outside the borders of their dominance hierarchy. You know how it goes. One minute you're marching around, and the next you're shooting Jewish women through the head. These things happen. In Twelve Rules for Life, Peterson conceptualizes order as tribe, home, and country, the greatness of tradition, trains that leave on time, the flag of the nation, and living room. Hitler conceptualized order as tribes, folks, and states, the home country, the cultural traditions of a great people, a train that departed punctually, the national flag, and living space. Order is trains that leave on time? Bit of a giveaway, don't you think? Here's another comment Peterson has made about order. And Hitler was very good at listening to the German population, and what they were demanding in a period of chaos was order, and so that was exactly what he decided to provide. And another one. Certainly what happened to the Germans could be regarded as immensely chaotic. In a society that's collapsed into chaos, you're going to get a demand for the imposition of order, and one thing Hitler was good at was order. If you've not read Hitler, you might be interested to know that he also talked a lot about order versus chaos. He frequently used the word order interchangeably with Nazism or Arianism, and he used chaos to mean negrification or Jewish Marxist Bolshevism, what Peterson labels cultural Marxism or the radical left. When Peterson accused the Canadian government of forced speech or mind control, in addition to saying that the non-existent legislation was the product of a communist plot, he said it was the upshot of the Marxist element. This is what Hitler referred to as Jewish elements. What I'm saying is this. While before members of the Canadian Senate, Jordan Peterson channeled Adolf Hitler to intimate that the Canadian government was being run by a cabal of scheming Jews. If you would never interpret it that way, that's fine by him. He's looking for people who would. He's trying to recruit goons. Think what I'm saying sounds unhinged? In a sense, I would agree. The wheels fell off Peterson's tricycle long ago, which is to say, he's insane. And his movement, or the Jordan Peterson phenomenon, as dubbed by the media, is a cult. It's a cult that makes QAnon look like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides. A key difference between QAnon and the Jordan Peterson phenomenon is that QAnon's beliefs are not concealed, whereas Peterson's beliefs are. QAnon followers are aware of their movement's fantastical and fascistic beliefs whereas many of Peterson's followers are not. Circling back to order and chaos, Hitler declared, I overcame chaos in Germany, I restored order, whereas Peterson cryptically informs his followers that order is white, chaos is black, and he counsels them to confront chaos and transform chaos into order. Peterson writes, The Great Father is order, placed against chaos. The Great Father is the tyrant. We can assume that Peterson means the Austrian tyrant, who opened the death camps in which Peterson could have tortured children, because he has said to his students, while showing this Hitler Youth propaganda poster, Hitler's the Great Father. He's the all-seeing Great Father in the background. He's like the Wizard of Oz, fundamentally, you know? So he's partly order, and that was a huge part of Hitler. And that's partly what was attractive, because Germany was absolutely in chaos. So that made order more and more attractive, right? Remember Peterson talking about the orderliness gone mad at Nuremberg? Here he is praising Hitler for his orderliness. 
Hitler appeared to be someone who was very high in orderliness and very high in openness, and I think that was one of the things that made him charismatic. I sometimes watch Dr. Todd Grande make psychological assessments about serial killers. He often describes them as being high in trade openness because they're open to new experiences. For example, being a serial killer. Peterson has said that Hitler was charismatic repeatedly. Here's another example. So Hitler became the embodiment of the dark desire of the mob, and that's partly why he had the charisma. It's right. Of course, it's possible for people to say that Hitler was charismatic without being a closet Nazi. Many historians say that Hitler was charismatic. I might say that people found Hitler charismatic because it's commonly understood that his ability to persuade helped him rise to power and annul democracy. So we need to consider how Peterson says this and why. I would posit that he often makes such remarks in a state of euphoria, and that he does so because he thinks Hitler was wonderful. Indeed, he has moodily said, "You can't say that Hitler wasn't charismatic. You can't say that he didn't do wonders for Germany's economy in the first part of its reign." Hitler also opened concentration camps such as Dachau in the first part of his reign, and his economy was a war economy, and the war was meant to make possible the Holocaust. But Peterson failed to mention this. Instead, he came to Hitler's defense. Remember him asking, "What do we see when we are swept up in the fire and drama of a national socialist rally?" He talks about the Nazis in fire often. For instance, you want to burn everything that the person who disgusts you owns, and so you'll see people who are pushing the nationalist agenda hard. And Hitler did this beautifully. Everything that was outside of the Aryan domain of purity wasn't to be feared. It was disgusting. It was contemptuous, and it should be destroyed and purified by fire. And that was his message. The Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire of purification as a symbolic message. And there you have it. The Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire as a purifier. And Hitler hoped to burn everything that wasn't Aryan beautifully in his purification campaign. Think of the things that were burned in the crematoria at Auschwitz. Where Peterson says he could have worked as a Nazi guard. In fact, Peterson has said nice things about Auschwitz and declared he could have happily worked there as a guard so many times. I've lost count. Here he is delivering a lecture that was televised by TV Ontario, which is Canadian public television. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound to another and then back again. Now that's evil as far as I'm concerned. And you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective, in a sense, because it's a celebration of horror. According to the book Mengele: The Complete Story, male prisoners at Auschwitz were worked to exhaustion before being killed by being made to run with 100-pound bags of cement, not wet salt. Not that that really matters. What does matter is that Peterson omitted that the victims were being worked to death before he described Nazi evil. But a good kind of Nazi evil, because it had an aesthetic quality and was a celebration of horror. Years later, Jordan Peterson told Joe Rogan that this artistic evil was a concept that he could really sink his teeth into. I can imagine taking someone who just got off a transport train and have them carry a 100-pound sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other. People don't like to picture themselves doing that because it's too frightening. But I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe I could even enjoy it. Jordan Peterson could enjoy it, and he tells his cult followers that they could enjoy it too. And if you suggest to them that this is not normal, they'll prove you wrong by sending you hate mail. Do you recall Peterson saying the Germans are good at order, and one thing Hitler was good at was order? Well, according to Peterson, Hitler and his goons were good at nearly everything. Peterson. Hitler was a master of speech. Peterson, and here's something to think about with regards to Hitler, because one of the things you might ask is, how the hell could he be so absolutely compelling to his audiences? Peterson, Hitler was able to bring this tremendously artistic force into his politicking, and it was captivating to people. Peterson, there's one story about Hitler. He um he won a medal for heroism. Peterson, Hitler won a medal for bravery. Peterson and Hitler was also an admirer of willpower, so he could stand like this. Peterson gives the Nazi salute for eight hours in the back of a car. Peterson, Hitler was very proud of his ability to stand like this. Gives the Nazi salute for eight hours in the back of a car, 
and his ability to withstand trying circumstances by willpower alone. Peterson, so Hitler was very proud of his ability, for example, to stand in the back of a car, going through the hordes of people that were worshipping him, and to stand like this, Peterson gives the Nazi salute, for like eight hours at a time, he saw that as a single application of will, and he was obsessed with hygiene, right? Peterson, Hitler was unbelievably good at letting the crowd tell him what to say. Peterson, Hitler was unbelievably good at spectacle. Look at how absolutely perfectly ordered that Nuremberg rally is. Peterson, the Nazis were very good at theatrics. Peterson, Hitler was pretty good at speaking. Peterson, Hitler was very good at addressing the crowd. Peterson, Hitler appealed to the darkest fantasies of the crowd, and he was really good at it. Peterson, Hitler started to reindustrialize the economy and was actually pretty damned good at that. Peterson, there were the Nazis first. They were pretty good at occult nonsense. Now, tell me the truth. Well, this is the internet, so tell yourself the truth. Have you ever heard Jordan Peterson talk about the occult, let alone the occult in connection with Nazism, let alone the occult in connection with Nazism in a way that was praiseful? I'm going to guess that the answer is no. But this isn't the only time he's mentioned the occult, said something positive about the occult, when he calls it nonsense, he doesn't really mean it. He said that the Nazis were good at it, like they were good at so many other things. Nor is it the only time he's mentioned the occult in relation to the Third Reich. Maps of Meaning and Beyond Order each contain multiple references to the occult, both explicit and hidden. Twelve Rules for Life contains occultic poetry. Remember, those books are primarily about the Holocaust. Yet, what have we heard about Peterson's occult interest from the media? practically nothing. But then, if the media missed Peterson's blatant Hitler praise, and I've documented reams of it, that they would miss oodles of badly concealed references to the occult, specifically to Aleister Crowley's satanic religion, known as the Lima, is unsurprising. This is why I said Andrew Anthony's reference to Dungeons and Dragons in the Guardian review was close, but still wide of the target. Pankaj Mishra's claim that Peterson was peddling fascist mysticism was also close, but no one appears to have followed up on it. A Swedish historian named Mikkel Nilsson accused Peterson of making a barrage of revisionist falsehoods about Hitler and Nazism, noting his strangely generous framing of the Nazi leader and his reluctance to use the word Holocaust, but no one seemed to pay attention to or follow up on that either. The alt-right figure, Vox Day, wrote a book arguing that Peterson was a mentally ill occultist who had borrowed many of his ideas from Aleister Crowley, but people who identify as liberal refuse to go anywhere near the book or even say Vox Day's name. Let's review. Fascist mysticism, Dungeons and Dragons, archetypes in Harry Potter, Nazism, occultism, mental illness. At times, when Peterson is blathering about Hitler's amazing intellect, he has repeatedly called the Fuhrer brilliant and a genius. And when he's ordering his acolytes to pay attention like the all-seeing eye of Horus, remember him calling Hitler the all-seeing great father, it's as though he wants to shout, don't you get it? I'm an occultist and a neo-Nazi. However, most of the time he's cryptic about his latent belief system, blending occultism with crypto-fascism. The word occult comes from the Latin occultus, meaning hidden or clandestine. As for crypto-fascism, the term can be traced back to Theodor Adorno, and Peterson has written contemptuously of Adorno and his fellow Jewish thinkers. But of course, the practice of crypto-fascism precedes Adorno, and has probably been around forever. The Nazis, it must be said, excelled at it. They had all sorts of euphemisms and codes for their crimes. As early as 1924, Adolf Hitler and his mentor, Dietrich Eckhart, used a story from the Book of Exodus to float the idea of expelling or exterminating the Jews. Put another way, Hitler and Eckhart used Egypt as a stand-in for Germany, like how the pharaoh believed he needed to enslave the Jews and murder their children because they were growing in numbers and becoming a fifth column, Germans should do the same. In other words, 18 years before the start of the final solution, Hitler was alluding to genocide through the medium of crypto-fascism via biblical stories. Who is it that has a biblical lecture series? In Maps of Meaning and Beyond Order, Peterson talks about the book of Exodus and the Pharaoh who sent the Israelites packing, and he has likened liberals to a fifth column, 
a phrase used by Hitler in Mein Kampf to characterize the Jews, who he linked to liberalism. More on that later. For now, know that occultism and crypto-fascism are similar in that they rely on the manipulation of ordinary signs and symbols. Think of it as corrupted semiotics. For instance, the occultist Aleister Crowley wrote about communing with his holy guardian angel, by which he meant the devil. Crowley had a cornucopia of synonyms for the devil, including the lord of the universe and the hawk-headed mystical lord. He posed for a photograph wearing a robe that featured a cross, and his language might often appear, to the uninitiated, to be biblical. But Crowley, who had grown up Christian, was corrupting or inverting the Bible. For instance, when he spoke about the light of God, he meant the light of Lucifer. Achieving illumination signified achieving satanic illumination. By Crowley's own admission, he often wrote in a code, or what he called a magical cipher. However, cracking Crowley's code is child's play. After three or four books and you've got it. Alistair Crowley was heavily influenced by Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, John Milton, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Other sources of inspiration include Immanuel Kant, William Blake, René Descartes, Walt Whitman, and Thomas Henry Huxley. And here we have another coincidence, because all nine of these figures are cited as influences by Jordan Peterson. A violent misogynist, fascist, racist, and anti-Semite, Aleister Crowley was obsessed with Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf and a book by Hermann Rauschning called Hitler Speaks. Crowley noted correctly that he and Hitler had highly similar writing styles. And in order to attract mostly working-class enlistees into his cult, Crowley claimed that Hitler had been influenced by his writings. But this wasn't true. The linguistic overlap is remarkable. Hitler often spoke like a necromancer, talking about mystical forces, ancient runes, Egyptology, and spirits rising from graves, but it really is just a coincidence. True, Crowley tried to send the Fuhrer his Book of the Law, sometimes called the Thelemic Bible, in the hopes that his satanic religion could serve as the, quote, philosophical basis for Nazi principles, end quote, and the, quote, base for a Nazi new order, end quote. However, there's no evidence that Crowley's book got through, and he sent it after Mein Kampf had been published. Yet he continued to say that the Nazis had been inspired by his religion and had even borrowed from him the swastika, which he claimed appeared on his heart when he was born. Anything to get recruits, who he would then exploit, control, and abuse. Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning is overflowing with Crowley plagiarism. I've documented hundreds of examples. Right now, I'm only going to give you one. Peterson, the many-breasted Greco-Roman goddess Diana, mistress of the animals. Crowley, the great mother of fertility, Diana of the Ephesians, many-breasted. Again, there are hundreds of these. Most of them deal with subject matter that is highly obscure and language that is highly similar. You could dismiss a few of them as happenstance, but you couldn't dismiss hundreds. And here's another example of copying from Beyond Order. As you listen to or read this, recall me saying that Peterson has urged his followers to slaughter goats in backyard rituals, and know that Crowley wrote about slaughtering goats in satanic rituals. Peterson, quoting William Blake, The lust of the goat is the bounty of God. Crowley, Blake was right in saying, The lust of the goat is the bounty of God. Crowley wrote, I have always considered Hitler a prophet in the Old Testament sense of the word, a more or less inspired madman who brings about the things that he desires by exciting mass hysteria. And Peterson has said to his students, then there's Hitler, a person who is able to produce mass hysteria in his followers. Much of Peterson's Crowley plagiarism comes from what Crowley called his autohagiography, entitled The Confessions of Aleister Crowley. One of Crowley's German followers, Marta Kunzel sent a copy of Confessions to the Gestapo. Kunzel believed there were two Führers, Adolf Hitler and Aleister Crowley. In a reverential letter to Crowley, she said, It began to dawn on me how much of Hitler's thoughts were as if they had been taken from the law of Thelema, and the close identity of Hitler's ideas with what you wrote in the Book of the Law endowed me with the strength necessary for my work. Aleister Crowley and his brainwashed German adherent sending occultic matter to Hitler and the Nazis was not as strange or as ambitious as you might think. 
In Becoming Hitler, Thomas Weber tells us that several occultists gave Hitler copies of their books, but that they were typically shelved unread. In Hitler's Monsters, Eric Kurlander says that Hitler almost certainly read one occultic book called Magic, History, Theory, and Practice by Ernst Schertl, underlining sentences like, Satan is the fertilizing, destroying, constructing warrior, and he who does not carry demonic seeds within him will never give birth to a new world, as well as, our demon is struggling, and he is struggling in pain and hardship. We must struggle with him to share victory with him. This has also been reported in the Atlantic Monthly, and Hitler's copy of Magic features a dedication to Hitler from Schertl. And can you guess who played chess with Schertl in Berlin shortly before Hitler was made Chancellor? Alistair Crowley, who loved Germany and hated Britain. During World War I, Crowley wrote pro-German propaganda for German immigrants in America in a publication called The Fatherland. Hitler was also influenced by a form of the occult known as Theosophy and its founder, Helena Blavatsky. So was Aleister Crowley. Many top Nazis were influenced by the occult, and a mishmash of half-baked concepts bound up in something called Vokish Esotericism, which included astrology, Gnosticism, Nordic mythology, German paganism, Jewish Kabbalah, Christian mysticism, Luciferianism, and superstitious ideas from India and Tibet. And these areas converged with pseudoscientific notions like eugenics and racial hygiene. Remember Peterson saying that Hitler was obsessed with hygiene. Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, was an occultist and a Luciferian. Adolf Hitler believed in something called world ice theory. Alfred Rosenberg was into astrology, and Hitler's mentor, Dietrich Eckhart, was a member of the esoteric Tula Society. He was fascinated by Satan and the Book of Revelation, and his protege regularly regurgitated his occultic language, for example by calling the Jews satanic. Hitler told Hermann Rauschning that the Nazi party had to borrow from Freemasonry. The Nazis can be viewed in many ways. One is to see them as a giant, state-backed death cult with a psychopathic leader who identified as the savior, practiced crypto-fascism, and transmitted his psychosis and homicidal fantasies to others like a virus. There's a term for this in psychology, shared psychotic disorder, or in French, folie à deux. People who are psychopathic or narcissistic can persuade and coerce others into becoming psychopathic and narcissistic. Occultism, fascism, psychosis, and stupidity often go together. The aforementioned Theodor Adorno blamed occultism for the rise of the Third Reich, and he called occultism the metaphysics of dunces. I wonder what Adorno would say about QAnon. As I've said, in this series, I'm going to explain, mostly through an analysis of Beyond Order, how Jordan Peterson is an occultist and crypto-fascist. This is not something I can do quickly or easily, and in order for you to understand that what I'm saying is valid, you'll need patience, inquisitiveness, and thoughtfulness. Skepticism is good, but arrogant certainty, that is, insisting that what I'm saying is invalid without even really considering the evidence, will not be helpful, and you will continue to position yourself as someone who's being deceived. Jordan Peterson is not who you think he is. He has spent his life building an elaborate and mostly hidden belief system which is quite complex. He speaks in what Crowley called a magical cipher, only there's nothing magical about it, and it's fairly easy to decode. Like this claim, I'm going to make a number of assertions that may initially seem ambitious or even outrageous, but I have evidence, and over time, once you learn Peterson's techniques and tricks, you should understand what it is he's really doing, which, at the most basic level, is encouraging his followers to harm themselves and others. Peterson has many malevolent aims, but one is to achieve what Trump tried to achieve when he sicked his trolls on the US Capitol. Only many of Peterson's followers, who aren't terribly bright, think he's telling them to have better posture and tidy up their bedrooms. In a way, Peterson's lack of transparency and his cult followers' lack of intelligence has been good. In making this series, I have a number of objectives. I will list some of them now. I want you to understand that Peterson almost certainly has schizophrenia or dissociative identity disorder what used to be called multiple personality disorder, and that he reveals this often, including in Beyond Order, without people realizing it. 
I want you to understand that Peterson almost certainly has narcissistic personality disorder. I want you to understand that Peterson is trying to communicate with other people with the same or similar disorders. Yes, that's what I said. If you've ever been unable to comprehend Peterson's speech, a common complaint, this is probably one reason. If you're a fairly normal person, he's not talking to you. He's talking to people like him. You and everyone else are just along for the ride, in many cases, paying his bills. I want you to understand that Peterson is a rampant plagiarist who systematically copies from Adolf Hitler, Aleister Crowley, Carl Jung, Friedrich Nietzsche, and others, although the plagiarism in Beyond Order is sparser and more covert than in Twelve Rules for Life and Maps of Meaning. I want you to learn the basics of Peterson's crypto-fascism. I want you to understand how and why Peterson blends occultism with crypto-fascism. I want you to understand that Peterson is a chronic liar, a con man of the first rank, who probably hasn't told the truth since he was a teenager or before he descended into schizophrenia in his early 20s, an event he documents in Maps of Meaning, if anyone would take the time to read it. I hope to convince you that Peterson is the leader of a massive cult and that he and his cult followers constitute a public menace. I'm going to go through and provide commentary on Peterson's new set of rules until, hopefully, you realize that what I'm saying is not a hoax, but that I'm describing a hoax, a sick joke perpetrated by Peterson on just about everyone, and this almost certainly includes you. However, it is easier to fool people than to explain to them how they've been fooled, so I don't expect overwhelming success. I don't need to do this. At some level, I don't even really want to. I don't do it to seek attention. I do it to inform and issue a public warning. Please don't expect much in the way of technology. I'm not a YouTuber. I'm a writer. Yes, I have a book called The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler, and I'm promoting it. Don't look at me like that. If you walked by a restaurant with a sign saying, lunch special $9.99, you wouldn't think twice. In part two, I'm going to start by explaining how the first image in Beyond Order, adapted from a tarot card called The Fool, was commissioned by a demonologist named Arthur Edward Waite, and was copied by Aleister Crowley. Arthur Waite and Aleister Crowley were associates in an occultic organization known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The things you don't learn from journalists, eh? That concludes part one. Please be sure to listen to part two. Thank you, and goodbye for now.